Hi, this is Paul. Last week, a podcast got my attention. I've been obviously interested in the work of Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay, and Helen Pluckrose in their Sokol hoax effort to unmask some of what's been going, the woozling going on behind some what they call grievance journals. And so Peter Bogosian did a podcast, and he explored what he called the um, on the intellectual podcasters the Great Realignment. And I heard that and immediately knew it very much crossed the paths of a lot of the other work that I've been doing. And so I wanted to put some commentary on this. So let's hear Peter on the podcast explain what he's doing. And I want to throw an idea out that I've been thinking about for quite a while. I'm not sure that it's true. I've asked people some ex extremely smart public intellectuals who agree and some extremely smart public intellectuals who disagree. And hopefully I can work out some of these thoughts with you in this conversation. So I'm going to give you some data points and let's think through this together. Okay. So around three years ago, I started to really think about social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, and their trappings in academia, trigger warning, safe spaces, microaggressions, etc. Right. And I started by asking the question, the Socrates question, how do you know that? How do you know that? Do you, is it based on evidence? What is your evidence for that? And I was very surprised when I asked my colleagues that they didn't have any evidence or if they did have evidence, it was testimonial evidence as opposed to, or anecdotal evidence. So I was also surprised that when I started asking that question, how upset people would become. Hmm. And I know from, you had Anthony Magnabosco on, when I did street epistemology, nobody ever became upset with me when I asked them how, how they knew their faith was a reliable guide to truth. So now I'm going to start giving you data points, okay? Mm -hmm. So I have had speakers come to Portland State University who self-describe as liberals. And those speakers were sponsored by the two most conservative groups on campus, Turning Point and they call it the only actually conservative groups on campus, Turning Point and the Republicans. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear with you, I've never lied to anybody about what I believe. I am a liberal. I've never voted for a Republican. And I am an, a very out atheist. Mm -hmm. So why do you think the two conservative groups on campus put up, for example, Brett and Heather? Brett is a Bernie supporter, for the record. Right. And by put up, you mean kind of hosted them or sponsored our events sponsored the events hmm. uh, I can I can take a moment to guess but do you want to tell me no I don't um, okay but I want to give you more data points okay okay so and hopefully me giving you these data points is gonna fill in a picture of something I've been fascinated by and thinking about for quite some time now so let's fast forward to the grievance studies affair. Mm -hmm. We published or got accepted to be published seven papers in peer reviewed journals. The Wall Street Journal caught us. We had seven more under review and we had retired six at that point. So we had seven and we were well on our way to 13 or 14. Right. The people who excoriated me for that were my leftist colleagues my the administration was not happy about that and then i started receiving emails i remember my my feeling the first time i received this email i was i was you know the greeks call it aporia i was perplexed yet i was also blown away and the email the first one that came in read something like this I know that it is very odd for an evangelical Christian to be emailing you 
an atheist to thank you for what you did, but I really want to thank you. And then it went on. And then they started pouring in support from evangelical Christians. And to further contextualize this for you, I've been all around, pretty much all around the world, giving tours about how to talk people out of their faith. I wrote a book called The Manual for Creating Atheists. I've published about this stuff. And Christians in particular, but religious people in general, were writing me in droves to support me. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Um, It's like your enemy is my enemy, so it makes us friends. Okay, and what do you think that enemy, who is that enemy? Uh, in this case, I imagine it's the the people who are the nidus of the the grievance studies or whatever kind of whatever label you want to put on that memeplex. So, what word did you use? The nidus. The nidus, yeah. Okay. So. And this is just my first speculation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know this is. There's so many moving parts to this. It's so complicated. <laughs> Excuse me. So I started thinking about this, utterly fascinated by it. And then I started thinking, like, so let's go to let's go with this enemy of my enemy thing. Mm-hmm. I originally used to think that <clears throat> here we have a thousand, two thousand year feud between atheists and religious folks. Now, that right away caught my attention because a 2,000-year flu between atheists and religious folks, uh, how many actual atheists can you find apart from perhaps, because if you read, let's say, Plato, he's always talking about God or the gods. Um, Plato obviously has his own conception, but apart from a few Greeks, perhaps a few atheists. Uh, everyone else is religious all the way through. So uh, no no atheists all the way back then. No atheists for 2,000 years. No atheist um, groups. Theists pretty much all over of varying different stripes. We'll get into some of those questions a little bit later, but let's keep going. And then the aliens come down. right? <laughs> so the aliens come down and they start taking atheists and <clears throat> excuse me and religious folks wholesale and you know probing them performing medical experiments killing them by a thousand i used to think it was something it's so funny he gets all alex jones on us <laughs> oops got to be here i think it was something like that and the aliens in this case would be intersectionality mm-hmm. and then i thought that's far too crude of a metaphor it's not accurate let's let's take a a quick peek at the breakup of the atheist and skeptical movement Mm -hmm. so atheism and skepticism was ripped apart by the social justice movement and and when i talked to james Lindsay, you can go back and maybe i'll put the link in the show um, when I talked to James Lindsay, that was the, the revelatory moment for me. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't. So, so here's a big problem. So you have all everything going on in an atheist community and everything going on in a Christian community. And obviously, they don't know a lot about each other. So it's really helpful to listen and to talk to each other to learn what's going on in each other's respective communities. And the social justice movement broadly was composed of individuals. You know, you saw the atheism plus movement. You saw the move toward, um, uh, this was before intersectionality was really a hot thing. It was toward oppressed groups, toward minorities. And you have things like the progressive stack, which is Selecting like at a concert of progressives, it, it came up from the Occupy Wall Street movement. So you, if if if, uh, if you had a, the most oppression variables, you would speak, and those with the fewest oppression variables wouldn't speak. In mm. concerts, for example, black lesbian women would come to the front of the concert, etc. This was right. in one of the papers we did. 
But what I didn't know until fairly recently was that just as the atheism and skeptical movements had its schisms, so too did evangelical Christianity is currently undergoing a schism. Hmm. And that schism, the fault line in that schism is along the lines of intersectionality. Do you need something other than the Bible to interpret the Bible? Do you need an intersectional lens to look at the Bible? Right. So intersection, so, so there's a schism in atheism and, and skepticism broadly, those two factions. And there's a schism in evangelical Christianity. Now, here's the fascinating thing to me about that, is that the schism, it's not about, you know, the exegesis of the text or how do you know, in hermeneutics, you know, how do you interpret the fact that you know, whatever the passages, this happened or this happened. So imagine, I think this is best diagrammed, that there are two bubbles. And in one bubble, there's skepticism and atheism. And in the other bubble, it's evangelical Christianity or Christianity. Now break those bubbles off into, so that there's a top bubble and a bottom bubble. So on the left, the atheism, skepticism bubble. On the top, there's atheists without a social agenda. And on the bottom, there are atheists with a progressive social agenda, intersectional atheists. So on the top, you have Michael Shermer, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, etc. Mm -hmm. Now let's jump to the other bubble. The other bubble on top, you have um, maybe hardcore is the right word, but you have um, I'm trying to think of what the word would be. Maybe more fundamentalist or um, literalist isn't exactly the word, but maybe we don't need a word. Do you have because I'm thinking through this myself as I tell you this. Mm -hmm. On the top, you have people who do not, evangelicals who do not believe you need intersectionality as a lens to view the Bible or Christian acts or faith. And then the bottom, you have people who do. Right. So you see how we have four bubbles? This is the thing I want to talk to you about. I call it the great realignment. And as I started saying, many people are, many people I really respect intellectually disagree with this, those with whom I've spoken, and many people agree. <coughs> Excuse me. So the great realignment is that the people in the top bubble are closer to each other than they are to the people in the bubble immediately beneath them. So the realignment is between it, it and, and it's the explanatory process by which I receive emails from Christians who support my work. Scores right. because the great realignment realigns people in terms of a few things. It realigns them in terms of whether or not there's objective truth. The people on the bottom, and I don't say bottom in a demeaning way, but the people in the second bubble have taken in philosophy what we call a subjective turn. It's the turn towards subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Whereas the people in the top, the top bubble, the first bubble, have objective truth. That's one commonality. They disagree okay. on what that is. Okay. Now I can see right here that I've messed up my my uh, variables. So let me let me fix that a minute. If those of you who are watching the watching the YouTube. There it's fixed now. It's correct and what that is but they agree that there's a world that exists independently of them and you can know that they also disagree on the methods that sometimes they disagree on the methods that you use right right but the second thing which is extraordinarily interesting to me well within that category you have truth claims like that the people in the top bubble believe that you can make a truth claim independent of your subjective position in a system so it doesn't matter in a, in a social context. It doesn't matter if you're cis, hetero, none of those variables matter. You can still see this enlightenment project, use reason and rationality as these critical tools and live a better life. 
Actually, I had it right the first time, so I'll fix it again. Live a better life independent of any oppression variables you do or do not possess. Mm -hmm. But something else is really interesting to me about this. And when you dig deeper into the second thing, you understand the speech wars, what college, you know, free speech on campus and disinvitations. You understand that those things are really proxies for something deeper. So what that second thing is, is that it's the rules of engagement. It's the people at the top bubble agree to the rules of engagement. And the rules of engagement in this case are discourse and dialogue and not weaponizing institutions. They're not Antifa people. They're not trying to rip down whole systems and bring bullhorns, for example, to give you a specific example, to college classrooms if they don't like it and blow the bullhorn. They're not demanding that Camille Paglia or particular people get fired because they don't possess certain oppression variables. I call this whole thing the great realignment. Hmm. That's what I wanted to throw out to you today. And I wanted to not tell you because I wanted to, I'm working this out myself. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to throw this out to you and get feedback so that I could refine it and hear if you think there's something legitimate to this or not. Right. Um, okay. A couple observations right away. The people in the top tend to be modernist. And yes, they do share rules of engagement to a degree, but I, if we look, if we look a little bit ahead, and if you look at Peter's actual book, uh, Manual for Creating Atheists, if you go ahead to chapter nine, he's got some pretty, um, he's got some pretty authoritarian institutional ideas in that chapter. Uh, containment protocols use the word faith only for religious context. Faith is an unclassified cognitive illness disguised as a moral virtue. So um, I think, I think Peter might uh, pull back from some of these, from some of these elements. So, so right away you, one way to divide these groups uh, maybe I'll just make it on the slide a sec. So there, I just added to the slide. So, so the top, the, these people that Peter are talking about, people that are not using the intersexual social agenda lens through which to see the world, I would call them modernist, and I would call their epistemology foundationalist. And and generally speaking, this comes out of um, this comes out of the Enlightenment. This is a rather Lockean view of knowledge and a, a rather Lockean view of the way we arrive at justifiable truth, publicly justifiable truth. Now, the lower section would, I think, be, be postmodern. And, and this goes to Jordan Peterson's, this gets into the Jordan Peterson postmodern neo-Marxist complaint. But, but there is definitely a cultural postmodernity about it in terms of the suspicion of our capacity to know things because of our subjective experiences. So you had you basically have modernist, foundationalist, objectivists on the top, and postmodernist, let's say perspectivalists on the bottom. So, so in that sense, I think Peter is onto something with this realignment because we what we are seeing both in the atheist community, but also in the uh, Christian community, even the evangelical community, part of part of what, how I would nuance Peter's critique would be to to bring in, let's say, the mainline perspective of the mainline and and other religious groups. There's there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Protestantism going on in some of this as well. And if you've watched my videos, you. you probably understand a little bit of what I'm saying. You can get at some of that in the Verveke video that I'm going to play in a little while. So in terms of what Peter has going for his theory, I would say, yeah, you've got basically a modernist, postmodernist split going on here. But I think there's something a lot deeper going on. And I think it has a lot to do with the Jordan Peterson moment. And actually, this comes out of a conversation that I had at the end of that I had last week 
which I thought was very germane to this. Now I've been queuing up my conversations because I'm going to go on vacation and I don't want to leave my channel blank while I go on vacation. So while I'm on vacation, there'll be a lot of conversations that I'll be posting on my channel. But but I had this conversation with a, with a doctor who had contacted me and we had we had quite a good conversation. And he he had this theory about the rise of Jordan Peterson and it has everything to do with, with new atheism. And it has everything to do with, I think, the realization that people don't really, that, that there is a, there's an implicit eschatology, which I'm going to talk about a lot in this video. There's an implicit eschatology, an implicit narrative within new atheism that has been at play and in fact has been receding. So... Here's the tape. I think the starting point um, of Jordan Peterson was the response to the new atheists and their claim that the commons, the kind of secular commons, had a metaphysical basis that everyone had to adopt to, in order to, unif to create a unified vision. And, and that's, that's really important here, that implicit in the new atheist project, implicit in Sam Harris's evangelical project. And it's in this way that evangelicals, modernist, foundationalist evangelicals and new atheists are very much birds of the same feather. They have very they have very similar epistemological foundations. They work with their foundations in very similar ways. And that's why, you know, you'll often have this sort of squaring off style apologetics on both sides going after each other but beneath this on both sides evangelicals obviously are saying everyone should bow a knee to jesus new atheists also have an evangelistic claim that they are promoting in the world and and you can see that very clearly in peter bogosian's manual for creating atheists that's one of the most that's one of the most that's one of the most um, obvious atheist evan evangelistic tracks and methods. He actually has written an evangelism book for atheists. And so there's this narrative beneath new atheism that that has been going on since since 9-11. And that's and that secular their vision was that the secular foundation was reductive materialism and naturalism. And their proposal was that we needed to do away with the transcendent and get on board in seeing the same world as a unified, you know, world consciousness in order to get rid of these crazy religious types who were doing crazy things. And that didn't wash, partly because the, um, partly because the argument that what the guys who flew those planes into those buildings did was reprehensible had already been agreed to by everybody. So the fact that they were making that argument in a very caustic and angry way, you know, kind of gets you a splash initially, but it's like, well, but we all agreed to that. <laughs> we, we all agree with that. So that doesn't go anywhere. And then in the back of it was this metaphysical claim. That is to say before the secular commons was respecting everybody's individual metaphysical commitments, including transcendent ones. And it was allowing those to exist. I mean, the Puritans didn't come to America to give up their Puritanism. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> right. So, so, so that's the wrong vision of the commons. That is to say that we need to go to the to Tyson, the guy who did Cosmos, very explicitly says this in that in that series that yeah. what we need is a, is the common vision, hmm. and and that and the, and the and the source of that common vision is science is scientism. Let's yeah. say yeah. that's that's the common vision that'll unify us, that'll allow us to have conversations together and do good things, and um, and that didn't wash because because reductive materialism naturalism and a non-transcendent worldview can't be sustained in any kind of, you know, in any kind of way. And so Jordan Peterson stepped into the breach of that. And then all of the believer, all of these metaphysical commitments that have their own version of a transcendent element to them, 
religious, spiritual, philosophical types, they all said, hey, he's our guy. So what you've got is a kind of a pluralistic group who are standing kind of facing the new atheists in a certain sense and saying, no, you're wrong about this. And that's a unified sense. So that's the first phase here that, that people feel unified around Jordan Peterson. But the question that I have as we, as we move forward is, what are we going to do with the plurality of that group of people who are looking to Jordan Peterson as their, as their voice, as their unifical, as their you know, singular voice? And, and I don't have an answer to that, but that's something I look for is what do, you know, not to diss my own religious tradition, but I mean, there is plurality in, in yes. Protestantism. <laughs> and we can't offer the thing that the new atheists were offering. And that's singularity of viewpoint. Right. I'm not saying that's a good viewpoint. I'm just saying we, what are we going to, how are we going, can we, I don't know, what do we do with that? I don't know. Well, and that will be the, the conversation that I, that I post at some point coming up. But I, I thought that, you know, ever since he made that point, it's been ringing in my head that, that he, he just articulated so clearly the, the worldview, the, the implicit narrative, not really that implicit, quite explicit, because Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty and the attack on any, any system that had a transcendent worldview had within it the promise that without this, without this transcendent, without this archaic, um, superstitious, these are the words that they used, archaic, superstitious, nonsense, then we would all be moral. And, and of course, when you see Peterson and Harris talk in their debate, Peterson just says, that's hogwash. Um, you, you eliminate people's sense of the transcendent. They don't just suddenly become rational and moral and, and reasonable according to your terms. They, in fact, become other things. And in fact, I think part of what we're seeing in what I think is behind critical theory, intersectionality, as Peter Bogosian talks about it, the postmodern neo-Marxism is, in fact, that and I'm going to make this point a little bit later on, part of what the new atheists lack was really an engaging, attractive, a sufficiently attractive vision that hit enough people where they were at. And so people will grab onto, <laughs> they will grab onto shiny moral things in order to improve their status, and they will do so very quickly. And And this is why we have this, you know, over the last number of years, we've had the the, this meme virtue signaling arise and and we're, we should talk and think a lot more about why we virtue signal what we get out of virtue signaling you know I, I just had a conversation another one that I'll probably uh, likely play coming up where where someone was making the point that this this person descended into nihilism and was reflecting on the um, the ways he was enjoying nihilism and and deriving status from nihilism and 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 you would think how could you derive enjoyment from something like that well there's a certain pride to it that goes along now now you'll find on unbelievable which which is a, a terrific program something that i uh, their podcast their radio show in england i've listened to them for years i love the i love the work that they're doing Peter Bogosian had a very interesting conversation with Tim McGrew. Tim McGrew teaches in Michigan, and he's a philosopher. And they basically they basically took on the points that Peter Bogosian had made to Phil Vischer. Peter um, Peter Bogosian had a definition of faith which didn't seem to make much sense to me, nor to Tim McGrew, nor to just about any Christian, because I mean part of the basic, and I guess Peter's working on a book about people talking across boundaries well one of the things that that one of the one of the skills that you should look for when you're talking across boundaries is if you're going to use a definition of somebody else's viewpoint it's really helpful if both sides agree on the definition especially if you're saying this is what you believe well find out if that's what they really believe but uh, so peter's I think Peter was quite confused on on how Christians work. 
and in some ways on how people work. And this is one of my larger critiques about the new atheists. I, I don't find people actually working that way. I find people being much more um, <laughs> irrational in their normal lives. Uh, Tim McGrew made a good point that faith involves a wager on, a, on the limited presentation of knowledge and evidence that people have. Um, and this is how most of us live our lives. None of us have enough information to go through the day. None of us know what's going to happen today. Uh, most of us deal with other people on a, in many ways, a faith-based relationship. Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about the emergence of eBay. And, you know, when eBay started, everyone assumed, well, people would lie about the products they sell and they'd try and not pay the money for it. And so the whole thing would collapse. And Jordan Peterson makes the point that people have noticed that a a foundational element of successful cultures is the degree to which people can extend trust to strangers. And that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of economics, because if, if I have to check every single piece, every single bill for counterfeit, or if I'm if transactions can't happen smoothly, if I don't, you know, send away to Amazon or to eBay or some other place and imagine that in a few days I will receive my goods and if the goods aren't as promised, I can return them. There's a high degree of trust that's built in and this pistis in Greek, you know, means faith or trust and in fact, trust is often the better translation for, um, for it than faith. Now, as I mentioned, some of the later captures, some of the later chapters of Peter's book are, were fairly authoritarian. And if Peter and I talk about it, maybe I'll see if he's he's still up on that kind of thing. Because I think what he's feeling now is, in fact, that someone else is taking the the reins of power. And I think I think Peter has a point in terms of his rules of engagement have changed. Too often, however, those who are the minority want the um, want the libertarian rules and the liberties, which is part of the reason why you know the United States was founded by individuals that were on the on the short end of the stick in terms of the British Empire, and part of the reason that the Bill of Rights developed as it did and the American system developed as it did was the sense that the majorities can become tyrannical, and so there needs to there need to be in a system. Uh, protections of minorities and it's disturbing in our political system to see you know even though we've only got two parties to see the two to see this continuing to develop in the senate and the house in terms of their rules uh, rules when you're in the majority you should continue to respect rules that protect the minority because quite likely in two or four or six years you will be in the minority and things change hands quickly. And so uh, Christians will agree with Peter Boghossian because uh, the new atheists now where they used to imagine that they were in an ascendant position now find themselves their own house divided in terms of atheists and they're in a in a losing position and in fact a lot later on in the in the podcast they'll talk about the you know losing the culture war not only have evangelical christians lost the culture war but uh, i think sam harris peter bogosian um james lindsay and another and a number of other atheists feel themselves losing the culture war and that's why they're speaking out and suddenly religious liberty mm, atheists might um, desire claims on legislation for religious liberty now, whereas prior, when they felt that they were winning, those didn't seem quite as important. And and exactly the same thing can be said of 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 Christians and atheists who feel that they have lost a position of preeminence in the culture. So there's there's a lot going on there politically and socially now. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about faith or discuss this element of Peter's book. He used a definition of faith, he used two definitions of faith, believing without evidence and pretending to know things you don't know. And and Tim McGrew rightly contested both of those both of those definitions of faith. And if you look at the English Oxford Dictionary, for example, uh the 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 first the first definition complete trust and confidence in someone or something it's not a particularly religious it's not a particularly religious word 
And in fact, most of the examples aren't religious. American political culture has a strong faith in the efficacy of markets and skepticism in the competence of government. Every single worry about how we socialize children is laid open to questions until one wonders if society, society has lost faith in our ability to socialize children at all. In an era when so many young people are falling victim to drink and drug scourge that is sweeping across the country like a typhoon, I had lost a lot of faith in our youth restored last week. We use this word faith for all kinds of things, and you know one of the most important synonyms that we have for it is in fact trust which is the first one given belief confidence conviction i don't think anyone really wants to banish the word faith or or basically make faith the exclusive purview of christian language now the second definition has a specifically religious aspect to it strong belief in the doctrines of a religion based on a spiritual conviction rather than proof um, I I don't particularly uh, I I'm not I'm not I'm a little skeptical about that definition. It is the second definition, and I understand where it's coming from. The two point one, the Christian faith, only in, once in the New Testament is 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 the Christian faith referred to as such. That's a later adaptation. Most of the time in the New Testament when you see the word translated in English as faith, pistis, um, it could easily and sometimes better be translated as trust. So, but, but I think what we're really talking about is not so much faith, but really knowledge and two ways of approaching the world. And as I've said many times, the Maps of Meaning begins with two perspectives on the world. And I think uh, the good Dr. James is dead on right that it's, it's, this is where Jordan Peterson really engages the atheist because he says, you know, there's a space, even though he himself, you know, acts as if God is real. The world can be conceived of in two ways, a space of objects where there's a knower or perceiver sees objects as they are. This is what I often call a monarchical vision. Um, you lose the subject and you crowdsource objectivity. And my complaint with this monarchical vision is that once a human being actually attempts to wield it or operate within it, it's like a clean room that they contaminate because subjectivity obviously comes flooding in. The difficulty that we have with a world of objects is that there are near infinite number of objects or aspects to do so. And so this theory of knowledge as an exclusive theory of knowledge really breaks down. And, and that's where Peterson comes in with his form for action. And faith, you know, apart from even a religious use of the term, is much more a function of this approach because we cannot know all of the objects in the world and we cannot know enough of the world so we have to proceed on limited knowledge and act in the world even when we don't know what all of the outcomes will be or whether we desire those outcomes and we see this we see this displayed in the four really six talks that Jordan Peterson does with Sam Harris that that Sam Harris keeps wanting to put forward this idea that we are simply that we can have an objective view of the world and Peterson says objective view of which elements of the world that in fact throughout human evolution we have developed an a priori structure now, once I get the, the video of the second session back from the conference that I did in Australia on this subject, I'll, I'll make the point that, in a sense, what Jordan Peterson does is concedes Darwin's point, well, maybe you don't need God for to explain the origins of the world. Now, that obviously is contested by many Christians and, and many other people, in fact. But Jordan will say, you very much need a sort of God, and I call this God number one, you very much need a sort of God, which is a structural filter, an a priori uh, filter, in order to have human psychology or human civilization. The filters are usually arranged in stories, and they're arranged in stories because this is, in many ways, what we are and the way that we engage with the world. It is not so much just a set of facts in a syllogism or a set of facts built up on, upon built up on a foundation to achieve certainty. 
we are, in fact, autobiographies. That is the best definition, really, of, I think, what we would call a soul or, or what we are. This is how we imagine ourselves to be. And we have value hierarchies nested within these stories. And because the world is so complicated, we use hierarchies and we use stories that have value hierarchies nested within them. And this is, in fact, what we're seeing from the postmodernists, that the intersectionality people are using this progressive stack. There's a nice little, little bit of language I picked up from Peter Bogosian in this use this progressive stack as a as sort of a value hierarchy but but it's always nested in and communicated with a story and the reason for this is that we don't really see objects now this is one of the early things i caught in jordan peterson's maps of meaning classes and this is actually from one of his earlier classes but he's dead on right here okay so and the other way of looking at it is when you're not, so there's lots of ways of conceptualizing what you encounter when you move into the world. And so we said, well, so what you encounter in terms of all of these objects, all of these facts, all of these things, there's lots of way, there's lots of ways that in fact, it isn't just when I walk into my office, I don't simply see everything in my office. In fact, before I see anything by virtue of this, this posture for action i am in fact training my eyes what to see my mind my unconscious mind will select for me to pay attention to that which is most relevant or relevant or salient for me when i come into the office in fact i don't see objects in the office well and peterson will get this and then we'll get to verveke you know there's positive things you encounter negative things there's expected things and unexpected things there's desired things and undesired things and another way of thinking about it which is more in, in some sense it's more uh, empirical is that you encounter tools and obstacles right and tools move you forward and tools are a funny thing because they're sort of half objective and half subjective right they're a thing but the thing is defined by their use but weirdly enough we tend to define thing by use you know and i mentioned this before so most people when they're thinking about language think that you use words to label things but it seems much more likely that we use categories as tools to act in the world and so we don't see things we see the use of things or the fact that they get in our way and so you're trying to set up the world so that what surrounds you are entities that you can use to get what you desire and to eliminate obstacles and in fact that's what you generally do if you're a good manager right a big part of being a good manager is to first of all lay out a plan for people that's a hierarchy and and where the hierarchical levels don't conflict and the second thing is you get rid of obstacles for them so that they can come to you and say well I can't do this because this is in the way your job is to get it out of the way so that they can move forward so and it's a very good way of conceptualizing yourself as a manager so now part of there's obstacles that you understand and those would correspond to the micro levels of the hierarchy right and then there's obstacles that you don't understand and when they come up they just blow apart your whole plan so now associated with that expected unexpected desired undesired tool obstacle is a corollary which is all the things that you're not conceptualizing as tools or obstacles or as things you don't know they're irrelevant and that's a really useful thing to know because it means that whenever you're looking at the world it's like the world is a sea of snakes and you're only concentrating on one snake at a time but then if you make a mistake dealing with that single snake what happens is you're neck deep in snakes because all of the thing the thing is when you make a mistake and this is a critical issue when you make a mistake and you blow the framework within which you're construing the world the framework that narrows it for you what happens is that all the things that you've been ignoring become potentially relevant and that's overwhelming and that's partly why your body reacts as if it's under tremendous stress so for example you know how these things work and again I think betrayal is the best example if you have a partner and they betray you then all the things that you thought were true about them aren't and all those things you ignored as irrelevant turned out not to be irrelevant at all so, you know, maybe the person told you on a twice weekly basis that they were too busy studying to spend any time with you. And, you know, you just 
put that down into the irrelevant zone after some coming to terms with it and then you find out well that isn't what they were doing during that time and then the next question is well what else did they tell you that wasn't the way it was and the answer to that is could it be anything it means every single thing about your relationship past present and future has now been cast into the realm of potential relevance and almost all the relevance is negative and that's the descent into chaos so that's the best way to conceptualize chaos is because what happens is that your plan is what narrows the world for you and constrains it makes most of it irrelevant the parts that aren't relevant positive and the negative elements relatively rare that's what the intact hierarchical plan does if you blow the hierarchical plan then all your nice little subdivisions are now irrelevant and every little monster comes up to face you and, and I would say you could see that with well, when you have the split, the betrayal of atheists from their tribe and the betrayal of evangelicals from their tribe because you neatly organize the world in people who believe in God like we do and people who don't. Okay, that's a nice two categories. Or people who don't believe in God like we do and people who do. Well, there's nice two categories. And so now what happens is, well, now you've got four bubbles and in fact, you've got all kinds of different bubbles going on. And now you're looking over at the the evangelicals, if you're Peter Bogosian, who are also modernist foundationalists and you say, well, these are our allies because we all believe in facts. And so based on playing this video, now I might be an enemy, but I'm not a, I'm not a, a critical theorist promoter in fact i'm quite critical of critical theory and even though i'm not very much of a modernist foundationalist well i might be an ally and so suddenly the world whole, the whole world gets more complex but but the point here is that in fact we see we see tools and obstacles and and we are highly attuned to status because of the great affordance it gives of opportunities and and so while we're you know, so then we're looking at the world, and again, this is pre-conscious. Our mind is sorting this world and and bringing all of the salience things up for us, and and we are we are doing this all on the basis of status. And now, again, I I've been a that's all. I I am not someone who tends to. I am not someone who tends to. Overlook the consequences of racism or sexism or any other kind of discrimination in this world these things are shot through for the very reason that peterson just decided we are all incredibly biased for ourselves and then after ourselves for our family and for our tribe and for whatever group of people we think are all around us this is how we proceed in the world and we can't help but do so and this floods into everything that we do now the problem that i have with critical theory is i don't think they get it right are there big problems yes but those aren't the only problems and this is where intersectionality destroys itself because you can, as Peterson says, you can just keep dividing the world until actually you're at the level of individual and then you have to start over. But now, one of the things that I really liked was um, Verveke did a video interview. It's going to be, I guess, a part of a bigger, a bigger video that this group is doing, but Part of what's going on here is, I think, the idea of truth. Because when I listen to the celebrity atheists, I hear propositional truth, propositional truth. What's interesting is that that's something I heard 50 years ago a lot of. You can still find the groups today. But 40, 50 years ago, heard that a lot from different Christian camps. And this is why this modernist approach to knowledge is in fact in many ways passe because of a lot of what psychology has noticed and you'll get a good course in this from john verveke's uh, meaning crisis course but in this in this video he walks through a bunch of it quite well is that uh, we think we're perceiving we're primarily perceiving objects it's a and it's a very sort of um model it's a model like very similar to what you see in Locke, sort of the idea that we get these impression of objects and then we form ideas around them and, and when I listen to Peter Bogosian talk about this, this way of, you know, this, these fact-based or evidence-based, 
you know, evidence isn't objects. And, and, I, and when I listen to them, I hear a lot of this object propositional procedure. I'm going to play quite, quite a bit of this video, actually, because the whole thing is really excellent. And then Gibson argued that, no, um, the objects are, are come later. They're sort of abstractions out of what we're actually perceiving are affordances. And so, for example, this object is graspable. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that... Right, that to see to, to experience it, to perceive it as graspable, is that is the is it being graspable a property of the bottle? Well, no, not really, because for many creatures, a praying mantis, this isn't graspable, right? Is it a property just of me? Is it a subjective property? Well, no, because you know, not everything I want to be graspable is graspable. It's actually a relational property. It's a real relational property. It's that right. There's properties of this object and properties of my hand, for example, that can be causally coupled together such that my hand can fit and make use of the objects in this object in certain ways. So the object affords grasping. The desk, this desk affords me placing things on it, right? So that's what you see first, and then the objects are inferred afterwards. Right, because what, and this is part of the whole idea. And you can actually see people practice this. If you ever see someone in a fight and they pick up something to throw at you, they're not paying attention to what the object is. All they're looking is at is graspability and throwability. And we see that all the time. The idea of embodied cognition, it's instead of thinking of yourself as sort of a passive receiver, that's the Lockean model, right, of these impressions. Think of the word pressing on you, right? Instead of thinking, you, uh, uh, instead of thinking yourself that way, think instead, no, this is what you're actually doing. In, in that it's your perception and your action are always deeply interpenetrating and conditioning and coupling each other. So I'm seeing that as I'm moving towards it, trying to make use of it. And you say, well, sometimes I sit still. Even when you're sitting still, you're usually shifting your attention around it, your eyes are saccading, right? And, and what, what you're often doing, right, is you're trying to get to a place where Marlo Ponti talks about this and Dreyfus and other, where you get what's called an optimal grip on it. I'm trying to get to the place where I get the, right, the sort of... That's only if you want to pick it up. Or does that just happen or even if you're just writing Even if I, first of all, we want to know what it is, right? right? But of course, those are not disconnected. I don't want to know everything about this. I, I want to know things that I can interact with it in terms of, like it's graspable or perhaps it's throwable. And that would be something different for me, right? You know, there's an, oh no, and I need to throw it, right? And so what it means is, okay, there's trade-off relationships. If I get, if I get too close to the object, I'm missing, I can't get, I, I'm not getting a lot of the structure. I might get some details here, right? If I get too far back and are static, I'm missing some of the details and I'm missing some of the, uh, you know, the curvature of the, so to get the cup, I have to move around. And notice getting the cup, getting a grip on the cup, it, it's dependent again, like I said, on what I need from the cup. My, I might need the details. You know, maybe, you know, I'm Sherlock, you know, oh, I need this very, I need the fingerprint. I have to get in, right? Or, right, I might just need it as a heavy object and then I don't need, but if it's graspable, do you see how, what, how, what I'm trying to do with the thing is going to affect, right, how I'm moving around it so that I get the optimal grip that is relevant to the task or the problem at hand for me. And so sensation and perception, the sensory motor loop, are bound up together. They're interpenetrating. And right, what's happening is right, I'm sort of being shaped as the object is being shaped in the sense of different features, different aspects of it are being foregrounded or backgrounded for me. Okay, what does that have to do with meaning? What that has to do with meaning is, uh, well, I mean, that, that's a long uh, question, but what I think that has to do with meaning is when we talk about meaning in meaning in life, so let, let's be clear, I'm not talking about what people talk about in, like, ultimately in semantics, like the meaning of sentences or things like that, right? I'm talking, because when we use that term for talking about our life, we're using it as... So we should be using different words. We're using meaning and then the meaning of life and then the meaning of a sentence. We should say meaning A of life or meaning yeah, B so, of a I sentence. Yeah, so I mean, and, uh, philosophers will often distinguish between like semantic meaning and existential meaning or something like that in, in order to... So right now you're talking about existential meaning. Very much so. Uh, and, what, and, and the way to think of the core of existentialism, at least one way of understanding it, 
It is our meaning making in this sense of the modes that I get into, right? So, right, I, I'm, I'm, I want to be careful how your, your viewers are understanding this, but I, I, I'm, I'm creating an identity for this as I'm creating an identity for myself. They're being co-created together. I am becoming a grasper as this is becoming a graspable thing. Right. So, As this is becoming graspable, it didn't. Yeah. Did, did that not exist beforehand? It existed, but it, 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 to think that the graspability is in it as a property, you, you won't find that, for example, as a property in in, in your physics ontology. Gra and because it's not, it's not an invariant property of this. As I said, this is graspable by me. It's not graspable of all. Yeah, but, but you can just say it's graspable by me without saying as it becomes graspable. Well, because I might not be using it. Um, that way, right? So I, I, I may never grasp it. But I don't, I don't, see, see, I don't get, because it's as if what you're saying is you, you have some motivation, you have some yeah. reason you want to pick it up, you have something you want to do with it. Right. But the object itself, from, the, from a physics point of view, let's say, from a materialistic point of view, doesn't change because what you want to do... Well, that, I think that's unfair. Here's why I think it's unfair. You're thinking that the properties of this object are somehow inherent in it like its chemical structure, where many of its properties are interactional properties that are only revealed or disclosed by it as it interacts with other objects or other things. So many of the real properties of things are relational properties. So if I say to you that sugar is soluble, is that a property in the sugar? No, it's a property that the sugar has in relationship to its interaction with water. Right? And so many of the properties that we want to talk about things, we shouldn't think of them as adhering in the object. They are disclosed in terms of how the object interacts with other things. One of those things that the cup can interact with is me. Mm -hmm. And the way I will, you know, shape it either physically or at least cognitively in terms of what aspects of it stand out for me or important to me. Okay, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but I'm just going to play the devil's advocate because most people are materialists, or at least that's how they're trained to think that they see the world in. That's a mistake, right? They shouldn't be materialists. I know, they, sh they shouldn't be. No, but no, no, what I mean is they, they should be physicalists. I mean, th there's a big difference between those. Materialism is an 18th century view, right? Materialism is the view that all that exists is matter. I mean, and, and that's a ridiculous view because it's unscientific. You should be a physicalist. You should believe that in addition to matter, there's energy, there's space, there's time, there's causal properties, there's fundamental forces, right? There's the curvature of space, there's relativity, there's, right? There's, you should be including all of those in your ontology. And many physicists are leaning towards the idea that, you know, information should be thought of as physical and part of the fundamental physics. That's what we should be Okay, okay, so about. let's say physicalist. Well, that's important, so, I think. So, then, so yeah. then what a physicalist might say is that sugar, dissolvability of sugar is an inherent property of the sugar, that that exists independent of whether or not water exists. Because you How would you know that? With a calculation. Like you make uh, up a hypothetical, sure. we can make up hypotheticals in physics all the time. We can make up hypotheticals about what would happen if this hit the wall. And it doesn't have to hit the wall, and we can calculate it. And then it I, I think the question here is, why would you do that? Because then we're back into a form for action. Because every there are limitless potentialities and what action does as peterson said what action does what subjectivity does is take the world of the infinite and make it actual and that's and that's where these things come together and that's that's finally the problem with this with this modernist with this modernist approach if we test it out and it turns out to be correct it could also turn out to be wrong right. and then we update our models right so you should right and so all of your ways of actually of obtaining your knowledge are actually dependent on getting things to interact together. Yes, you could try and a priori calculate all of this, but that's not how we actually do science, right? That's and in fact, we can't do science because that way, because time, because again, this is what what we're what we're barking at with all of this stuff is that the modernity arrived at many of its wonderful blessings that it has given us through science and technology by removing the subject and we've gotten to the end of that and realizing the subject needs to come back in well this is in a sense part of the critique of the postmodernists and they have a point but you can't take that point too far because there's still the other side so this is where 
this question of knowledge comes in. That's not a fair representation of how we do science. And to say that the, like the, if you had no knowledge of water's ability to dissolve things, how would you determine, you know, your hypothetical? With but now we get to no ability. Well, that's right. So does it exist independent of our no ability? And, and in fact, let's say a unicorn, unicorn pee, does salt, um, does salt dissolve in unicorn pee? Well, maybe you're going to have to run the calculation where you're going to have to figure out what unicorn pee is made out of. Maybe it's made of, um, you know, pixie dust and rainbows and who knows what what unicorn pee is made of. But this is part of the positive. This is part of the problem. So, well, there's no such things as unicorn. So there's no such things as unicorn pee and so on and so forth. Well, I, I mean, you would have to... There's a tree falling in the woods now. Well, no, it's not quite no ability. It's, right, there's a difference between no ability and whether or not it's a real property. I assume that sugar dissolved in water way before there were cognitive agents or life wouldn't have evolved the way it did. So I don't think this is uh, dependent on there being you know, cognitive agents with consciousness knowing that sugar dissolves in water in order for sugar to be soluble. But what, I, what it does depend is it depends crucially on a, re, a real relation between sugar and water and not something that is just belongs to water as a property itself. So you're using the word relation and interaction interchangeably in this? Yeah, because, I mean, interaction is a species of relation, yeah. Okay, so let's get bogged down a little bit further. Okay. <laughs> like, like Sam Harris and Peterson. Yeah. What is the notion, what is your notion of truth? <sighs> um, so that's a long question. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that one of my criticisms is we have a notion of truth that is too separate from um, the different ways in which we obtain knowledge about the world. Um, so, uh, uh, so our standard way of understanding truth, and, and the interesting thing about the, thing about the Greeks, for example, is they had four different terms for talking about this. Um, so... The model we have, the, 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 the dominant model we have is propositional truth. So we have propositions and then we determine if they're accurate or they correspond. And of course, there's a lot of philosophical debate, right? But some notion of they correspond to reality in one way. And that's, that's our epistemic sense of truth. And, that, and I think, if I understand him correctly, because it's very hard to pin Harris down because he always claims to be misunderstood when people try to criticize him. But anyways, uh, I think that the form, the notion of truth he is advocating is exactly that notion, and he thinks that's the sole notion of truth. Why do you think Jordan to be? And and see, so when I look at Peter Bogosian relating to this certain class of evangelicals, that's what they tend to have in common, that this is the sole notion of truth, except that what has happened is that atheists have said, well, it's all these things out here in the material, the physical world, this is our truth, and then you have certain classes, and this is why Peter Boghossian, in his great alignment, named fundamentalists, because there are certain individuals like Ken Ham, who will say, and see, so what happened in the modernist fundamentalist fight is that fundamentalists just slid the Bible in there and said, well, this is the Bible is our foundation of truth, and that's why I ask people if you if you must have a biblical cosmology, um, must you also have a biblical anatomy? Must you must you look to the Bible for all of your medical decisions? Because the problem I have is not the truth of the Bible. The problem I have is the conception of truth that these two groups are using for their ideas of truth. And so that's that's where my complaint is in terms of what they're doing. Doing with his notion of, of a pragmatic notion of truth, I think he's conflating a bunch of different things together. In his own little pre Petersonian form of truth. Yeah, because he talks about you know, the, 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 the truth in the world of action, right? And he talks about this in terms of pragmatism, and, and I take him to be using a, something like a Jamesian notion of, of pragmatism. Um, let me try and get at that. Um, there's... there's so in addition to knowing that things are the case, like knowing that that is a cup, right, and that's propositional knowing, there, there's procedural knowing, which, and I think that's part of what Jordan's talking about. So I know how to catch a ball. I know how to ride a bicycle. That's a skill. It's not a theory. It's a skill, right? Um, and, and, you know, there, it, it's even, you know, realized in different functions, areas of the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
So you know, form for action affords that much better than a space of objects. Things like that. So when I talk about skills, I don't talk about them being true or false, right? I talk about them being apt or inept. And that's pragmatic. That, that's part of what uh, pragmatism means, I think. Um, because to be apt or inept means that well, you have some goal. Well, there's some goal, um, but it, it, it's also the appropriateness or the fittedness of the action. So the standard there isn't really a standard of truth. So let me, let me try it this way. I think all the knowledges have a different way of talking about ways in which we find things to be real. One way is propositional truth. Then another, what skills give us is, they give us a sense of realness in terms of power, right? How much power we are able to wield, how much our actions can intervene and alter uh, the course of things. And that's definitely what's being um, emphasized by certain forms of pragmatism. Um, and it, you can even see it in, in some postmodernisms when Foucault is talking about the relationships between knowledge and power, right? And I think, but I think there's another notion. So the Greeks have ap episteme for, you know, theoretical truth, propositional truth. They have techne for these procedural techne. ability. Techne, it's where we get our word technology from. This is the, this is the knowing how to do things. Mm. Like, so, is that related to perspectival knowledge? No, I would say that that's a different thing. Um, and so I think the Greek word that corresponds to that is noesis. And so this is closer to our word for like noticing. And so what perspectival knowing is, right, knowing what it's like to have a particular salience landscape, knowing what it's like to be here now with these things salient to me and these things backgrounded, these things foregrounded. I'm offended that you refer to me as these things. <laughs> no, it's a bunch of things, sorry. What relationship does the perspectival knowledge have to truth? And also, let's just get to your notion of truth, because right now you're reiterating what you think Peterson's notion of truth is, or Sam Harris. Well, I am. So, well, I'm trying to get to my notion by distinguishing and contrasting mine with both Harris and Peterson. So unlike Harris, I think that there, I think truth belongs to a family, right, of ways of deciding how things are real for us. And then I think Jordan is calling what Jordan's talking about, he's talking about uh, some aspect of our procedural knowing, our techne, and one way things strike us, a criterion we use for determining if things are real is their power, which is different from right, the accuracy of our propositions. The perspectival knowing, studying this right now with Dan Chiappi, it has a different sense of realness to it. It comes with this notion of presence. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, we're, we're, we're currently studying um, scientists who do work with um, like the rovers on Mars. And what's interesting there is um, this notion of telepresence, being on Mars, mm -hmm. right? And you have to, you, it's important that you know that the, the rovers are not joystick controlled. You can't, in fact, you can't do that because the time delay is too great. So what you do is you get batch, you get all these photos and all this data, and then you sort of process it and then you set up a set of instructions uh, like to, to curiosity or right, things like that. Now what's interesting is you look at these people and you can see similar things when people are trying to do VR, right, virtual reality. They talk, they, 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 they talk, they talk about being on Mars. They, 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 they have this perspectival sense of being on Mars and they, they, they'll do things like they'll like, um, you know, okay, so you know, the rover needs, oh, here's my camera, and they'll say, you know, I, I need to, and they'll say, they'll do that. They'll do first-person perspective, first-person perspective. I, I need to turn this way. I need to turn this way, right, because the, light, the, the light's going to be here, and, and, and it's, if, I, if, I, if I don't turn this way, if I turn this, I, I, won't, I won't be able to get what I need. And they, and they do all this perspectival adjustment from the first-person perspective, right? And so what, what's really important to them, right, and they look for it in the people that are trying to join the team is that sense of being on Mars, being there, that sense of presence. And it's also a constituent, notice the word we use, virtual reality. It becomes more real to us when we get a sense of presence, when we get that sense of immersion, when we get that sense that we're, we have a perspectival salience landscape that is working for us. So perspectival knowing, noesis, has this sense of presence and then I think there's a, a third, uh, there's a fourth one, and you, and, and you can see it also a bit in what I was talking about um, 
with the scientists, right? There's a participatory knowing. This is, this is, and this goes to gnosis as a Greek term. This is knowing by sharing a fundamental identity uh, with things. And so, for example, uh, the scientists are identifying with the rover. Uh, that's why they'll say I. And, and when, you, when you write to identify with your pen, is that similar or not? Uh, well, that, th I think that's part of it. I mean, so part, when I'm writing, I think part of, there's two parts to the identification process. Part of it, when, when, when I'm identifying with something, I, is I'm doing what um, uh, uh, Polanyi calls indwelling. Like, I'm actually not sensing it, I'm sensing through it, right? And you're, you're not, actually, you're typically not paying attention to the pen when you're writing, you're paying attention to it. So that's one way. But you, you also do something else that you probably aren't doing with the pen as much. You do internalization. So, for example, you have metacognition. You are able to reflect on your own thinking. You don't come with that. Right? You get that by imitating adults when you're a kid taking a perspective on you. And so you imitate them taking a perspective on you until eventually you can do that for yourself. You internalize other people's perspectives onto you. And that's partially also how you get enculturated. So we identify things, and this is what you can see them doing with the rover. They're sort of indwelling, they're seeing through the rover, but they're also internalizing it into, you know, sort of becoming the rover. And we have lots of ways in which we have this kind of participatory knowing. So a really important way, um, and, and I think this goes towards some of Jordan's concern with narrative, although well, narrative also involves perspectival knowing. But we think of ourselves as temporally extended selves, like, you know, here's my past, here's my future. And so we have this sort of autobiographical sense of our of ourself as extended in time, right? That, again, isn't isn't sort of natural to us. We, we, we acquire that. Um, and we acquire it be, through the constantly practicing narrative. Uh, this is some of Daniel Hudo's work on the narrative practice hypothesis. We again think that thinking in narrative is natural to us, but notice that we spend so much bloody time practicing it. And we practice it all the time with each other. Like how? You meet somebody at a party, and they want to know who you are. What do you do? You tell them your story. You go to home at the end of the day. People want to know, how'd your day go? You tell them your story. We, but we wouldn't think of that as practicing, but we are. But we are. And notice what you do when you have a kid. What do you do? You have to practice narrative. And do you do, do they get narrative right away? Can, can they tell or understand jokes right away? No. And if you ask them to tell a story when they're really, Bleh. so what do we do? We, 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 I mean, I've had two kids, so I had to go through this. You know, you, you, you watch the Teletubbies. So narrative is not innate, but it's useful. It's, 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 and it's culturally universal. And like, it's, it's, so that, that, that to me, so it's not innate, but it's culturally universal. Yes. Because we usually look at cross cultures to see, do we all smile when we're happy? And then we say, oh, okay, we can infer so, that yeah. that's innate. Yeah, so you, you should use, uni I mean, universality is important. Um, so I, I don't usually make the inference directly from universality to innate. I make the inference usually to universal for having some fundamental function, right? And those aren't the same thing, as you just pointed out, right? And so let's go back to the Teletubbies. We, we do this really, really simplified narrative and, and watch the show. It's, it's horrific, right, as, as an adult, because it's repetitive and repetitive. And we're doing this because we have to we have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and slowly make it more complex until eventually we can do narrative and then eventually we can indwell narrative. I can start to see the world as a story and then I can also start to internalize the world as a story and I become a story. I'm a story and the world is a story. Now that's participatory knowing. I'm a story participating in a story and that story is participating in me. And that, right, that's... That's gnosis. That's, a, that's, a, that's another kind of knowing. And it, it, it gives you the realness uh, of, of that ultimate sense of being right, in tune, attuned, sort of one between you and the world. And so I think all of these are different ways in which we, we make judgments about realness. And I think it's a mistake. So here's the, how I return back to both... Uh, Harris and Jordan, I think it's a mistake to try and equate truth to any one of these. I think we should understand that truth, we should reserve it for what it's prototypically meant, the, the accuracy, the correspondence between the content of our propositions in the world. And we should think about
It, I would disagree with that, but he's making a great point here. Power, we should think about presence, and we should think about... I, I, would, I would disagree with that because, in fact, we use it more broadly than that in the language. And I think we could say propositional truth is what we're referring to. But, you know, you throw the your aim is true, as Jordan says. And and I don't think we're going to have the power to redefine the word faith um, the way Peter would like to. And language goes where it goes. And yeah, but it's in the, world. the accuracy, the correspondence between the content of our propositions in the world. And we should think about power, we should think about presence, and we should think about attunement as additional ways in which we connect up to realness. And now, that, now I can now answer your question. Those ways in which we connect up to realness, especially the, the procedural, the perspectival, and the participatory, that's where a lot of the meaning that goes into meaning in life is to be found. And, and I would assert as we, you know, we're dealing with, Peter Boghossian's great realignment, and when we get into critique of that, it ask the question, well, why are people, whether they be atheists or evangelicals, why are they moving to this critical theory posture and embracing this critical theory perspective? Why is it? Well, it's meaningful. Well, why is it meaningful? We're going to have to get there. What would Peterson say to that? What would his objection to that be? Because he would say he has a strong belief in his notion of truth. Okay, well, we'll leave, we'll leave we'll leave them there. Um, but you have the you have the propositional truth, you have the procedural or the power, or the techne, you have the perspectival and the participatory. And and actually, when it comes to, I, I would argue that new atheists have this have this participatory motivation when they are motivated by, we tend to be motivated, we tend to be drawn into our eschatology. We're drawn into our, our telos, our ends. And, and behind the, the new atheist was this, was this, was this story, this implicit story. And it was imaginative. It was this vision of, well, it's John Lennon. Imagine there's no religion and so on and so forth. And, and how, well, John Lennon's vision would square with Peter Boghossian's or Sam Harris's, I don't know. But but there's this vision of, we'll, we'll, well, it's a unifying vision. And in that sense, it's, it's quite Hegelian that, well, there won't be any more fighting because we'll all agree. And now you, you'll find this in, in the biblical narrative as well. Uh, you can find it in the book of Jeremiah. You know, everyone will know the Lord. And the knowledge of the Lord will be as the waters cover the sea. And, and so this, this, this idea that finally strife between groups and between people will be, will be gotten away with because all will know the truth directly. Difficulty is that the truth is much more complex than just objects in space. Now, now let's talk a little bit about this axial world division because again again Verveke Verveke has talked about this and and there've been some pushback from some people in terms of well is Christianity an axial age religion well when I'm using it here I'm talking about this the bible is the story of the reconciliation of heaven and earth okay that's what the that's what the bible is is really the story of and and so this is an axial style this is an axial style division in which heaven is a place, um, is a place, okay? It's a forum, it's a place, um, but it, you know, is it temporal spatial like ours is? Well, that's, you know, that's very debatable, especially the more we know about physics, you know, a timeless place is, it tends to be more what heaven is, it's a place without time. So it's not necessarily this geographical place, space like we have here space where the world is the way it should be um, and there's an imaginative exercise of projecting value um, encapsulated in story and it's seen as a place and if you if you look if you look at Peterson's work where he talks about you know how we you know we've got all this cognitive capacity that we use for our eyes that that we now see things so we talk about the modernist vision of well we get rid of all superstition and all of this what what sam harris would call bad information that we get from the bible or this bad language or this these iron age rules we get rid of all of these things and reason will then it's very interesting the way 
the word reason functions in there and you can have a long conversation as to exactly what reason is and and su suddenly now reason will show us well show us what because the pro part of the problem that i keep pointing out is that you have reason doesn't give you ends it doesn't give you presuppositions which is beginnings and it doesn't give you telos which is ends reason basically says gives you procedural knowledge about how you can get from a to b but it doesn't actually give you a and it doesn't actually give you b now sam harris tries to crowdsource b by saying the good is all the possible good you can think of but that's too simplistic it's too flat and, and we know that it's too flat because we simply don't work that way so in an actual age division you have a two world division you have heaven which is the way things are supposed to be we imagine it as a place we imagine it as something we can see and all of the biblical symbolism and imagery you have the new heavens and the new earth you have the new jerusalem of all of that and earth is how things actually are a place of confusion a place of suffering a place of decay a place of loss of agency a place of death and so that's the axial age division now part of again verveke and the, the axial age theory about you know how this stuff how this stuff came about as we manage the suffering of earth with stories of a connected but alternate reality and, and many have noted, such as N.T. Wright, that heaven and earth are very much connected. And really, sacraments are the places where heaven and earth connect. And that's, you know, you can get that, you can get that in terms of, in terms of theology. So, so we're managing suffering by, by stories of a connected alternative reality. And this is very natural of people. Um, you know, you listen to the Depression era song, The Big Rock Candy Mountain. Um, this, this is a fun song. Just, just look it up on YouTube, Big Rock Candy Mountain. And it's, you know, where the, where everything's great. Well, there's your two world, you know, you got a hobo singing this. He's just imagining what everything would be, you know, the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Christianity is about the reconciliation of these two realms. It's about heaven and earth coming back together. The heaven and earth were, were separated. The Garden of Eden was the royal garden of Genesis 1 is very much a temple narrative and Genesis 2 is in a sense the the royal garden and then there's a divorce and and what God does is he he kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden all right and they're out now into the field and so there's a separation between heaven and earth and you might notice in many medieval maps they would they would put they would put the garden of Eden on the map it was very much a part of their a part of their reality so and if you and if you and if you think about why our current maps don't have it on it you might do some real thinking about well how are we conceiving of reality how have we made the changes that we've made and so Christians are about the reconciliation of heaven and earth. And, and the book of Revelation, which I'm preaching through now, is, is actually about, well, what, what's it going to take for heaven and earth to be reconciled? Because you have to do something with all of the moving pieces. Then you get a lake of fire, so you know, a whole bunch go in the lake of fire, and then you've got the new heavens and the new earth. But, but throughout the Bible, I mean, all of these are symbolic representations. You have outer darkness where there's there's both flame and darkness and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth tim keller has a great comment someone comes up to him one time and asks you know is 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 hell really like you know the the descriptions that the bible has and he says something well those are basically those are symbolic descriptions it's probably far worse <laughs> so secularists actually functionally do the same thing they don't do it in terms of space but they do it in terms of time now that you notice that christians do it both in terms of space and time so you have heaven and earth as separate and then in the future heaven and earth will be reconciled so you have space and time secularists don't have space but they do have time and if you listen to them that's how they use it so the future is heaven for progressive secularists it's imaginatively projecting securing of values resolution of obstacles victory of political and ideological agendas etc and this is where dr james and his observation about the the new atheists was dead on correct he believed that you know they've got this story implicit 
which is exactly what they're promoting, this story about the world. And it isn't a story of heaven and earth. It's a story of present and future. And future is the eschaton. Future is heaven. Potentially, again, but now it's it's very much a a a heaven that must be human created and that's why it's humanist it's something that we must achieve it's something we must secure and this in fact draws a whole lot of pressure into the world because as i said well if we must secure heaven then those who are standing as obstacles for the securing of heaven are now in a sense if you translate it to christian language devils and you'll hear people use that language. In fact, demonic, because they're standing in the way of you getting to heaven. You can take all of this secular language and convert it into Christian language, and for the most part, it all works just as well. So you have the future, which is imaginatively, um, imaginatively project secure of values, um, resolution of obstacles, victory of political and ideological agendas, etc., and you have the present, the way things actually are. Confusion of ideas, strife, death, decay, impermanence. One of the big differences between, let's say, a Christian conception of eschatology is that individuals get to participate in it. If you're, in fact, a secularist, you will die before cancer is cured or death is eradicated or the 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 uh, climate global climate change is fixed so on and so forth in fact we may never get there but you definitely will never get there christians of course have a belief that they as individuals even if they die within this space and this is why within this space and time this is why space is actually a fairly helpful thing for christian ideology because they can go someplace and they're, in a sense, secured in heaven with their inheritance. And then at the last day, they come with their inheritance. And Christians, as individuals, as their own stories, can actually connect up into the full story. But if you're a secularist, you might be able to participate in it. But, alas, um, Bertrand Russell never sees the world he imagined. He himself never gets to see the future because he dies and goes boop into nothing all right secularists lack the second story functionality of heaven and earth and again as i've said a number of times that's really important because what tends to happen as miroslav wolf noticed in the in the yugoslav civil war after the breakdown of the after the the fall of communism is that those who must bring heaven to earth usually bring hell up for the devils. And so you will have devils and hell and all of those, and you will have those who, in fact, step out of line with your heavenly project. And those who are watching now the new authoritarian left are seeing that. And this is part of the point that Jordan Peterson has made over and over again, is that there's, there's something that happens there's something that must happen when you work on this sort of purity. And so heaven and hell, um, secularists lack the second story functionality of heaven and earth. So they tend to use a time exclusively. Christians, as I said, um, do too. They also use time, but in conjunction with the second story as their functional two-story system. Someday we will cure cancer. Someday we will beat death, so on and so forth. So both secularist Peter Bogosian has an eschatology and he doesn't have heaven he just has time he just has future Christians have both heaven where the individual can await the eschaton where in fact everything will come and again the the structure of secularism this is why I often say sec secularism is in many ways late stage Protestantism okay and I say that as a Protestant. I know a lot of Roman Catholics are going to hear that and say yes, and a lot of, you know, Jonathan Peugeot has made similar points. It's in a sense late stage Protestantism, and you're just taking apart the pieces, but the basic formulation is still the same. So you have this continual secular drift in evangelicalism too. Now, now you have progressive evangelicalism, which 
So you had the seeker movement. And out of the seeker movement came the emergence. And the emergent church split into the at least two. One branch was the young, restless, and reformed, and the other branch were the progressive evangelicals. Now, two guys born the same year both planted Mars Hill churches. One of those was Mark Driscoll in Seattle, a very progressive place. He plants a young, restless, and reformed church. The other is, the other is, oh no, I can't think of his name. Love wins. Um, um, Vel, you know, oh, I gotta pause. I can't think of his name. I'm not gonna do this without thinking of his name. Rob Bell, Super Soul Sunday with Oprah. Rob Bell also plants a Mars Hill church. His Mars Hill church is in conservative, reformed Western Michigan, Granville. He takes over Grand Village Mall and plants Mars Hill church there, which is progressive evangelical. Mark Driscoll goes to Seattle, plants Mars Hill in Blue State Seattle, which is young, restless, and reformed. So progressive evangelicalism has, has basically been tracking with the social justice warriors. And progressive evangelicalism increasingly looks to bring in the eschaton now. And that's why I see progressive evangelicalism as a, basically as in, secularism is increasingly pressed on so secularism, the rise of the nuns, and as I as I'll talk about in that second lecture that I did in in Australia, you have this you have this split as as nuns tend to get either atheistic or pantheistic. Those tend to be the two movements they go in. Okay, they get atheistic or they get pantheistic. They get they don't get irreligious. They get spiritual, but not religious. They don't get more rational as Sam Harris imagines rationality. Now they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do a whole bunch of other spiritual things. They're not going to give it, give up on spirituality and think a lot about that word spiritual and what it means. So, so what happens with progressive evangelicals is that progressive evangel evangelicals get more secular. Well, what does that mean? As they get more secular, they get less and less, they don't fully give up heaven. They kind of, you know, that's heaven's really useful in terms of afterlife. Heaven's really useful in terms of individual participation, but they tend to, along with other secularists want to bring the kingdom now, want to bring the eschaton now. And, and that movement, this is why, you know, Jordan Peterson's sacrament of meaning can be pointed in many different directions. It's very meaningful to be part of a movement, to be part of a mission, to be part of a great calling. It's that, that meaning itself doesn't necessarily orient you in the right direction in terms of what is good. But it will orient you in terms of what feels satisfying in terms of achieving. So evangelicals have always had a realized eschatology, which is the now and the not yet. That's very much a part of Christian theology. And it's always been on a spectrum. But now you can hear progressive evangelicals more and more talking about bringing in the kingdom. Now, I usually use bearing witness to the kingdom because, generally speaking, I think in terms of my own theology, within the age of decay, any witness of Christ will be cruciform. And so the cross is fundamental in terms of what that means. And that gets into this, the dynamics of eschatology. But, but what, the, what the progressive evangelicals have tended to do is they have, they have much more realized eschatology. We're going to bring in the kingdom now. And, and this actually has if you look at the history of the mainline church, you have the, the history of the different, the different esch eschatological theologies. You have premillennialism, which was, in fact, the Christian expression of modernity at the height of modernity. It was postmillennial in terms of we're bringing in the kingdom now. So you have this implicit post-millennial movement in the progressive evangelicals. And notice how these are aligned, how these arguments are used along the lines of their social agenda and gender issues. Now, it's important in American history to appreciate the role of the civil rights movement and the connection between the civil rights movement and progressivism at the end of the 19th century. 
if you've ever listened to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, it is a post-millennial eschatological hymn. Here's John Brown, and he has his Bible open, and I think it says it's Alpha and Omega. And just recently, I, I read a really terrific new biography of John Brown. Um, you know, very, very interesting figure. But the, the war between the North and the South in the Battle Hymn of the Republic is posed in eschatological terms. And you will find terms used in the book of Revelation right there. This was the coming of the kingdom to free the slaves. I've been preaching through the book of Revelation. So you have the visions from Revelation 5 and Revelation 7. And they're very diverse. People from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So therefore, every color. And, and these are... However, these are the Christian people who have suffered for the cause. All right, the civil rights movement, um, the civil rights movement in the United States was a revelation to secular America too, and it was the kind of revelation that they could they could get down with, that they could agree with, that they could that they could participate in, that could come close to their heart. Um, difficulty, and if you watch one of my favorite channels, if you listen to um, uh, John McWhorter and, and Glenn Lowry talk about race. I think those are some of the best conversations you can find on the internet about race. The civil rights progress stalled in the 1970s. Why? And, and a lot of what we're seeing is because of that stalling. Well, basically what happened was a lot of the low-hanging fruit was, was resolved. A lot of the, the racism built into American law could be undone. And and that view of racism said, well, so we're going to, it's basically Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision from his famous 1963, it's a 1963 from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, it's the content of people's characters, not the color of their skin. And you'll notice that this is now very much under threat by what I call progressive liberationism. But let's pause here and ask a question that I find so seldom asked with all of the charges of racism how exactly do you do you define racism um so you had reasonable progression on race in terms of how racism was taken out of the laws in terms of the jim crow south but but what exactly is racism and and one of my go-to things on this is a a blog post on slate star codex scott alexander um entitled against murderism and he said well as usual, the answer that racism is a confused word um, is that racism is a confused word that serves as a mishmash of unlike concepts. Here are some of the definitions people use for racism. Number one, definition by motives, an irrational feeling of hatred towards some race that causes someone to want to hurt or discriminate against them. So it's an irrational feeling or a motive. All right. Definition two. Definition by belief. A belief that some race has negative qualities or is inferior, that would have to be within an aspect, especially if it is innate or genetic. And this is why the race and IQ debate is so very, very hot. Number three, definition by consequence. Anything whose consequence is harmful to minorities or promotion of white supremacy, regardless of whether or not it is, it is intentional. And what you'll notice is that in terms of critical theory, definition number three comes to the fore. The difficulty that you have, which is pointed out by Jordan Peterson and many, many others, is that reality is so enormously complex that there is generally not just one set of cause and effect or consequence. And in fact, when you listen to the term racism being bandied about, if you just pause and ask someone, what do you mean by racism? Can you define it? You'll find people stumbling around. Now, racism impacts institutions. Of course it does. Outcomes of um, are one of the most objective ways that we can measure. Certainly they are. We can count how many people are of what race or what sex or what progressive stack element are within a particular group, and this was the James Damore business. How to address racism in systems is enormously difficult because you don't know, generally speaking, everyone's pointing at number three, but they're insinuating number one and number two. 
And the truth is, dealing with these outcomes is enormously difficult, and we don't even necessarily know whether it's whether it's wanted. I, I find nobody addressing the fact that, you know, how many garbage people, garbage collectors in America are of such and such a race? How many low status jobs are of such and such a race or such and such a gender, so on and so forth? Are we really going to have equal distribution all along the way? Are we going to have firefighters who are in wheelchairs and disabled? Well, they've got to be a firefighter even if they can't climb a ladder. So, this is where the competence argument that comes in that, that Jordan Peterson produces. You have the unresolved complexity to racism as a concept um, as a concept here in Against Murderism, and I, I highly recommend that article to read. And you have bias in human nature. Now, again, as we looked at both Jordan Peterson's and John Verveke's presentations in this, Biases form within us because of salience. Infants learn the face of their parents. Um, infants have positive or negative experiences with some things and not other things. Foods, animals, people, aspects of people, so on and so forth. This gets built into us. You might call this implicit. This can't simply be unprogrammed, nor is it necessarily desirable that we unprogram it. So you have bias in human nature. Religious people tend to use their geographic plus time eschatology, and this is how bias will be dealt with. Secular people tend to use time-based. Notice how we often refer to the year. Well, it's 2019 and we're still, name your oppression narrative. Well, here's the difficulty that you have if you're a secularist. There's no way to unprogram people. They're, they're cooked. It's set. So are you just going to wait for all the bigots to die? And you imagine that in your new your new, new process, there won't be as many bigots? There's actually been dramatic strides made against racism in America. Part of my complaint about the current strategy is that I, I suspect it will actually make America more racist by focusing our attention on it. Let's imagine you have a... Let's imagine you have a young, well, let's take a, a black boy and a Jewish girl. Let's imagine that you tell both of these people, you know, the reason that you have any suffering in life is because the anti-Semitism or the misogyny or the racism that this other group of easily identifiable by color group is exerting on you. Just keep pumping that into people. What are you going to get? You're going to get the same thing you had in Germany when you had the entire government telling people, you know, the reason that things after the after first world didn't call it the first world after the Great War was given away, it's because of the Jews. Just keep telling people that. You know what you're gonna get? You're gonna get violence. It's gonna be a mess. But yet we keep pumping more energy into identifying and blaming people based on the attributes of their race. And I look at what's happening now, and I think, we're just setting up the next generation of racists here, folks. Can't we expect to find bias in individuals? Always. How can that bias be exercised? In Christian theology, it's rather mysterious, but the assumption is that Christians will somehow be translated and perfected because Christians... Most Christians, now Christianity is very diverse, most Christians assert that we will continue to be sinners and practice sin and have these biases and do wrong until we die. And at that point, God's going to have to do something with us. But at least sinners are, in a sense, grandfathered in until they die. What's the solution in the secular realm? Well, you're going to wait till they die? Or you're going to make the kingdom come soon by a little bit of euthanasia for the old bigots or re-education camps until you learn that, well, you know, after a certain age, after about 25, it's not a lot of re-education you're really going to do with people. And in fact, well, look at 1984. Uh, go ahead and try and re-educate them. They'll probably lie to you plenty because... Well, as you get into the Jordan Peterson stuff, once everybody starts lying, everything comes apart. 
Now you see the impact of secularism in evangelicalism. Less confidence in the supernatural efficacy of God. One of the things that I've been noticing in evangelical missions is that it used to be that the focus tended to be on conversion. Okay, so spiritual conversion, helping people to profess Jesus. More and more Christian missions tend to be focused on secular values. Now, that's not a bad thing. In the Christian Reformed Church, we have uh, World Renew, which works on relief and development. That's helping the poor has always been a part of the Christian program, right from the very beginning. You can find the Apostle Paul when he's talking to the elders in Jerusalem in Acts 15. And, and they said, well, here are some rules about blood and about Gentiles, and continue to help the poor. And Paul says, I love helping the poor, because in terms of Christian theology, love your neighbor, love your enemies, help the poor. Generosity to the poor is actually a common package of many world religions, part of Judaism, part of Islam, part of Buddhism, so on and so forth. That's not unusual. But Christians used to focus on conversion. And, and, and what that did, now I know that gets despised and mocked, but, but there's a transformation that happens there, and that transformation is actually crucial and important. So, so i got to keep my eye on the time here. So, Christians, I've been noticing, progressive evangelicals tend to increasingly no longer look at that. Well, what does that mean? It means that these secularizing impulses are in fact coming more and more into play. And now again, without the second story or the concern for the second story, everything gets focused on the timeline. And when everything gets focused on the timeline, we get itchy trigger fingers. We get, we get itchy trigger fingers. I didn't say that very clearly. We tend to want to bring the eschaton now. And because the eschaton is a product of what we do, we are going to take increasingly more and more dramatic action to bring it in. Now, I often hear Republicans say things like, well, why do many black folks vote, black folks vote Democrat? Instead of Republican, when the Republicans were the were the, was the party of Lincoln. Well, that's true. About ten percent of Black folks vote re, vote Republican, but the Democrats are the party of LBJ, and LBJ flipped the script, flipped the political script on racism, and a lot of the a lot of the progress, the progress against racism, happened by getting rid of the laws that were discriminatory against African Americans in the American South. So if you if you have difficulty understanding why so many black folks voted voted for um, vote Democrat, well, there's LBJ and how that works. But now pay attention here, what happened during the civil rights movement is that during the Civil War, a lot of denominations split along the lines of slavery. And so you tended to have northern denominations and southern denominations. And southern denominations tended to side with the Confederacy. And this is where, again, people are very complex. It's it's Peter Bogosian's initial idea of how people work that, well, here some people work on the Bible and some people work on evidence. That's not how people work. People are multivariable creatures and so you've got Christians in the north that are against that are against slavery during the Civil War and Christians in the South that are for slavery and and read Mark Knoll Mark Knoll is a member of the Christian Reformed Church uh, teaches at teaches at Notre Dame read his book on the theological divide of the Civil War and you can see all of these things happen well there's there's a fair amount of there is a fair amount of racism under there's a fair amount of racism under any of the categories that was that was still very much present in the United States in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s and that's what those laws were intended to address. Many evangelicals like my father my father took a church in Patterson, New Jersey, I think partly because his new bride didn't want to be too far from her family in Whitensville, Massachusetts. But down in the lower picture here is a picture of my father um, meeting with, um, in a room with all black guys, 
many of whom in that room were getting were getting clean from heroin as heroin went through Patterson in the 60s and 70s. And there's my father and his clerical collar and his his clergy his clergy um, his clergy get up and they're talking about the gospel and they're talking about getting clean and they're doing all that work that 12 step type type work of sobriety and here my father as a guy who was raised in the depression era midwest on the farms is now learning how to live with black folks in patterson new jersey that's where i grew up that was the that these were the biases that were built into me when i was a young man and so this is where i'm from and so what happened is that with the continual evangelical inferiority complex, evangelicals always feel 10 years behind the curve. And so on this way, evangelicals tend to be very anxious about virtue signaling with respect to race. And this is what you see happening, I think, Peter, in evangelicals, that they don't want to be behind the curve again. They were on the wrong side of history in the Civil War. They were on the wrong side of history in the Civil Rights Movement. They don't want to be on the wrong side of history on racism or sexism again. So they keep trying to keep up with the left. And this is why you tend to see exactly what Peter was talking about. And I don't really think it has a great deal to do with, with that evangelicals believe in the Bible, and which is their data, and atheists believe in the other. I think it has a lot more to do with a whole lot more sociology that's going on. And again, we see tools and obstacles. We value moral status. Anti-racism today is, is pretty cheap, okay? 70 years ago, if you're an anti-racist living, let's say, in the American South, much more costly, even in the American North. Today, you can be anti-racist and be celebrated. It's a very cheap moral flag to buy. It costs you almost nothing. Secularism pushes us to bring the eschaton which is the future for secularists, into our present frame. And especially if you're a secularist, if you're an atheist individual, you will never see your eschaton. The best you can hope for is the big sleep, okay? And so that's motivation to bring in that eschaton. And evangelicals that are getting increasingly secular are now feeling the same motivation. And so they're, well, everybody's, well, who's not going to be against racism? Don't ask too many questions about, well, what exactly do you mean by racism? Will, will your project actually succeed in reducing racism, or are you trying to do something that the tool simply doesn't connect with? So where is critical theory going? Well, now we're seeing this these funny relationships. And James Lindsay, who I talked with on my channel, had a conversation on Unbelievable. Usually it's the Christians against the atheists. Now Unbelievable has Christians and atheists agreeing. And if you look, if you listen to the, the Neil Shenvey, Esther O'Reilly, James Lindsay um, episode of Unbelievable, and they just keep agreeing on stuff. And when James Lindsay and I had a conversation on my channel, we had a great time. And, you know, I'm going to invite Peter, uh, Peter Bogosian to have a conversation with me. We'll have a great time. He had a great time with, with, um, with Phil Vischer. And, you know, they, they disagreed with things, but as, and I think when Peter talks about their similar rules of engagement, I would argue that, in fact, these rules of engagement come to us via Christianity, at least in the West. I still have to dig this one up, but one day when, um, when Eric Weinstein was on the Rubin Report, I don't remember when he was there alone or if he was there with his brother Brett, but Eric made the point that, in a sense, you have to know that everything's going to be okay to maintain these rules of engagement. And this is exactly part of my critique about secularism, that if you don't have a two-story, there's all this pressure to bring the kingdom now. Well, when that pressure to bring the kingdom now increases, your temptation to treat your political adversary as an existential threat also increases. And it's in those cases that you tend to find 
the pressure to do the kinds of things that Jordan Peterson laments what we saw in both Nazism and communism. Because that's the pressure. Because you've taken away the second story. We must bring the kingdom in now. These people stand in the way of the kingdom. And I, as an individual, will never see the eschaton because there is no second story. So I would argue that, in fact, the rules of engagement and the belief that one way or another, the future will be good. That confidence comes from Christianity. Now, it's often critiqued by saying, well, that makes Christians lazy. Yep, sometimes it does. But the flip side of that is, when you don't have that eschaton, well, that makes secular people murderous. Yes, it does. And for reason. It's reasonable that they become murderous because they're trying to bring in the kingdom as they see it. I think that's a really important point. A house divided cannot stand. I think critical theory will collapse. Uh, it's a coalition that breaks down quickly, and you see it already in terms of the feminists versus the trans activists. And, and what you tend to see, as what we saw with Jordan Peterson and the new the new atheists, as long as the other side, if one side seems to be gaining power, if the other side can create a coalition of all kinds of groups, they'll usually bring them down. It's a religious vision, but so is everything else, including, I'd say, the vision of, the eschatological vision of the new atheist is a religious vision. It's a story that is built on premises and faith. It's an article of faith of new atheists. You don't have any data. In fact, I'd say the data is against you. That, in fact, once people stop being religious, they will be rational in the way that Peter Boghossian or Sam Harris or, or Dawkins are rational. In fact, they don't get rational. They tend to get spiritual. And they're getting religious and critical theory, which is offering, basically offering, cheap morality. That's where they're all going. And evangelicals are going there too as they get more secular. So, almost two hours, but there's my answer.